Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone from a reassuringly sunny Scotland. Uh, my name is Eamon Keane and I'm an Early Career Fellow in Criminal Law and Evidence at the School. It is my absolute pleasure this morning to introduce Dr Abana Awusa Bempa. Uh, Abana joined the LSE in 2017 as an Assistant Professor of Criminal Law and Criminal Evidence. And prior to that, she was a lecturer in law at City UL. She's also held positions as a lecturer at Sussex and was a research assistant at the Law Commission for England and Wales. She holds degrees from UCL and from the University of Bristol and is a fellow of the Higher Education Academy and an associate fellow of the Ghana Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. I'm personally delighted to be able to introduce Abana this morning as she is a scholar whose work I have relied upon extensively myself of late. She's someone whose work casts a real critical perspective uh, on both substantive and procedural issues related to the criminal law and is published on diverse uh, matters ranging from defendant participation in criminal trials through to the fair prosecution of hate crime. She's here today, obviously, to speak about ongoing work relating to rap music and its use in criminal trials in England and Wales. So without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Awusa Bempa. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to come and speak about my work in progress. I'm just going to share my screen to get my slides up. Um, okay, so this is looking at the admissibility and use of rap music as evidence in criminal trials. This is something which, according to anecdotal evidence at least, is becoming increasingly common, um, possibly aided by access to material through phones, through YouTube, through social media. It's something which has received more attention in the US where scholars and lawyers have been raising concerns about the prejudicial effect of relying on rap as evidence, as well as the discriminatory nature of this practice, given that it's used predominantly as evidence against um, young black defendants. Here in the UK, interest is growing in this topic amongst academics uh, and practicing lawyers. Um, and there's a, a growing body of literature which looks at the policing and the criminalizing of rap and rappers, usually from a cultural studies or a criminological or a sociological perspective. So my work is being informed by these perspectives, but I'm focusing on what happens in the courtroom and the application of the law of evidence um, in relation to rap lyrics. Uh, I'll say a bit more about what I'm doing in terms of a research project shortly, but I thought I'd first start with a little bit of background or context in relation to the topic. So I'm sure that everyone is familiar with rap as a genre of music. Um, it originated in the Bronx in New York in the 1970s as the musical component of hip hop culture uh, and started out as party music and then evolved to um, include political and social commentary. It's a picture of DJ Cool Herc at the top of the slide who's credited as being an originator of, of hip hop music. It spread across the US and then globally to become one of the, if not the most popular and profitable genre of music. In the UK, we've had many distinct subgenres of rap. And there's some pictures across the bottom of the slide from the early 2000s through to the, the present day, um, sort of representing this. UK rap has been influenced not only by American rap, but also by um, UK dance music and music and culture coming directly from the Caribbean and West Africa. The most popular subgenre at the moment here is drill. Drill originated in Chicago, it became popular here in the 2010s, it took on its own sort of distinct UK um, or London or even South London style. And most of the recent cases that involve the use of rap as evidence concern drill music. And that might be because it is one of the more popular subgenres at the moment. It has gone mainstream. There were a number of drill albums in the official charts in the last year and there's a very a wide and diverse fan base, but also drill is characterized by violent content. So references to stabbings, to shootings, to drug dealing are the norm um, within drill. And I'll say more about that, the significance of that um, later on. Despite the violent nature of some rap music, it can be very beneficial um, to participate in rap. So there is the prospect of commercial success and financial gain, uh, cultural reward. It's also rap has been described as providing a safe space for black people and providing a kind of therapy, a way of working through and expressing difficult emotions and experiences. It can also help to facilitate identity development, build self-esteem and linguistic skills and enable people from more marginalized um, and disadvantaged parts of society to express their dissatisfaction and to seek to affect um, change through social and political commentary. 
Um, so for many, the financial, the social, the personal gains that are derived from participation in rap can make it an attractive alternative to committing the crimes which some people are, are rapping about. Yet rap has long been viewed with suspicion by the authorities. Possibly most famously in the US, the FBI investigations into the group NWA in the late 80s. In the UK, there's also been a long history of, of criminalizing um, and devaluing black culture and, and musical forms. Recent examples that involve rap um, would be the Metropolitan Police's Form 696, which was a live music risk assessment form used until it was scrapped in 2017. It included questions which sought to ascertain the ethnic identity of a potential audience, which would then be used to um, assess the level of, of risk of disorder and so on. And effectively it became used as a means of shutting down black music nights, especially grime nights. We've also had prominent politicians, including former Prime Minister David Cameron, publicly declare that rap music encourages crime and violence. And we see this play out across newspaper headlines. Drill has been a particular target of the media and the authorities. And there's some examples of, of headlines on this um, across this slide. Um, opinion is divided as to whether drill causes crime or whether it is a response to crime. There is no empirical research to substantiate claims that it actually is a cause of crime in itself. But the police and the, the criminal justice response to drill has been very heavy handed. So hundreds of videos have been removed from YouTube music videos at the request of the police. Gang injunctions have been imposed against rappers which prevent them from rapping about certain things or appearing in certain videos. Uh, criminal behavior orders have also been imposed, probably most famously against uh, drill artist Digga D, who's pictured at the top of the slide. He was the subject of a, a documentary on the BBC recently. He has to give the police 24 hours notice before releasing any new music and his lyrics have to be vetted uh, by the police before they're released. Now these kind of practices, gang injunctions, criminal behavior orders, they're beyond the scope of my current project. I'm looking exclusively at the use of music as evidence in, um, in court, but they do demonstrate the, the broader criminal justice response to the perceived threat of rap, which I think has been disproportionate and arguably discriminatory. I have no doubt that it's um, influenced or informed by the criminalization of black people more broadly, which we see through the overrepresentation of black people at every stage of, of the criminal justice process. And using rap music as evidence in court fits into a wider pattern of marginalizing and, and criminalizing black youth and black cultures. And I'll say more about how this works as I go through the present presentation. So turning to what I've been doing as a research project, I've been analyzing reported appeal cases in which music videos and lyrics are used as evidence of a crime or taken into account as an aggravating factor at sentencing. Um, and I think through these cases we get a pretty good indication of what we might call the profile of rap cases and the way in which the law of evidence is being applied to rap music or music more generally in court. There are important limitations to what I can find out through looking at appeal judgments. So they don't tell us the extent to which prosecutors are actually using or seeking to rely on rap in first instance trials and or the extent to which judges are more likely to admit or exclude the evidence. There is anecdotal evidence around that. As I mentioned earlier, there's suggestions that this is happening more and more often, um, but we don't have any empirical research on this. And I'm not sure how we would quantify this um, anyway to actually come up with numbers. Appeal judgments also tend to lack detail about the exact nature and context of the evidence or lyrics or music videos at issue. In many of the cases, this could be because it's not actually being challenged on appeal. So in many of these cases, it's mentioned in the judgment and in some cases talked about in some depth, as part of the evidence which was presented, but it's not forming um, a ground of, of appeal. But still, and especially where we it is subject um, to appeal, we would expect to see the greatest level of scrutiny of legal issues that arise in appeal cases, including the legal basis for admitting evidence and questions around its, um, its prejudicial effect. So we should be able to get a good idea of um, how RAP is being handled in criminal trials through an analysis of appeal judgments. So to find these cases, I've simply been doing searches on legal databases using various search terms. Um, so far, I've found 38 cases, which from, and I should highlight, even though this is at the, virtually at the University of Edinburgh, I've been looking only at cases from England and Wales. Um, and I've found 38 cases so far from, from England and Wales, which I think are relevant to this topic. Um, 34 of them concern the use of rap music. The other four seem to cover other genres, but it's not always explicitly stated what the genre is. 31 of them involve the use of lyrics or videos as evidence against a defendant, 
or as an aggravating factor at sentencing. The others I've included because I think they're relevant insofar as they link rap to crime or character. And most of these are um, using where there's mention of potential for use of rap as character evidence against a non-defendant witness. But the vast majority of cases involve the use of uh, rap music as evidence of a crime or taken into account at sentencing. From these cases, a number of sort of themes or patterns became immediately apparent. And so it's these which I'm, I'm going to sort of give a, a talk through and raise some of my main concerns around them. So first of all, just to reiterate that the vast majority of cases involve rap as opposed to any other genre of music. And some of the search terms that I used were really quite broad, like lyric or music video. So I had expected to find a range of cases where music is being used as evidence. And it seems that only rap is being used in that way, which could suggest a deliberate targeting um, of rap as a genre, which is consistent with the fact that there are police officers who spend an awful lot of time on YouTube going through rap, especially drill videos, looking for um, evidence of crime. Um, the earliest case I found goes back to 2005. That was actually one of the few that didn't involve rap music. I think the earliest rap case was 2007. And I've done searches through to the end of last year. The most recent 16 cases were reported in the last couple of years. That could suggest that there has been an increase in the use of rap as evidence, which would be consistent with what, what I'm hearing anecdotally. It could also suggest an increase in challenges to the use since these are appeal cases. It also coincides with the rise in popularity of drill. And as I mentioned, drill is a particularly violent subgenre of rap. And on that point, most of the cases involved crimes um, which involve weapons, usually firearms offenses, so lots of possession of firearms with intent to endanger life, or violence, uh, including some murder cases. This is not surprising because reference to weapons and violence is very common in rap music. Um, especially in a subgenre like drill. And some people do rap about their own experiences and things that they have themselves observed or witnessed, but much of rap is fictional. Um, it's entertainment. It relies on figurative language, on symbolism, on hyperbole. Uh, and violence and weapons can be used to symbolize courage, skill, power, to denote lyrical prowess. It's also a great way of gaining attention and ultimately success. We know since the rise of gangster rap in the 90s that violent content sells. And for many fans, the more authentic it appears to be, um, the better. So if the defendant is a rapper, there is a good chance that at least some of their music will contain references to violence and weapons and may do so in an intentionally convincing way. Uh, we can't take it at face value. It's not reliable as a statement of fact because of the conventions of the genre. So at a minimum, the relevance of it needs to be scrutinized very carefully to make sure that it actually relates to the crime which the defendant has been charged with. And I'll talk more about how the courts assess relevance later on. Um, most of the cases that I've come across involve crimes committed and tried in London, a few from Birmingham and, and Manchester, so they're, they're almost all from um, large urban areas. Defendants tend to be young, most of them were teenagers, and in the cases that I've found, this evidence is only ever used against uh, male defendants. It's also clear from the case law that the rap is being used and music more generally is being used as evidence almost exclusively against black defendants. Um, to a lesser extent, Asian defendants, but by and large, um, appealants of defendants were uh, black. This could suggest a deliberate tactic. So we have what looks like a deliberate targeting of rap as a genre and specifically for use against um, black defendants, which could be the prosecution drawing on stereotypical narratives about black youth culture um, and tapping into pre-existing biases about black male criminality as a way of constructing case theories. And I think that's possible partly because of themes within rap, um, but also and more significantly because of stereotypes that already exist in society around black people and rappers as uh, criminals. So prosecutors can use rap to help build a case in which um, black boys and men fit into the figure of the criminal without having to say as much and he looks like a criminal he sounds like a criminal he raps about being a criminal he must be a criminal and we see the racialized nature of this also in the link to joint enterprise cases and gangs so about half of the cases that i've found were committed by way of joint enterprise and here rap is often used to link defendants to each other you know to their so-called associates 
um, and then to the offense. We know from other empirical research, particularly that of uh, Becky Clark and Patrick Williams, that Black people are overrepresented in joint enterprise cases. And this seems to be a contributory factor. So their research has shown that RAP is much more likely to be used as evidence um, of joint enterprise in cases involving Black defendants than white defendants, and often as a way of building a gang narrative. And on that point, most of the cases which I've found have said to um, be gang related. And here the lyrics or videos are often used as evidence of gang association or gang membership or affiliation, which is then used to link the defendant to the crime. And sometimes the way in which this is done is um, really very concerning. And I've been using the case of Sode as a key example of this because it really stuck out to me, partly because of the age of the appealant. So at the age of 14 years old, he'd appeared in a music video where according to a police officer, he'd been making remarks and gestures which were consistent with support for a particular gang. Two years later, there is a murder. It was a joint enterprise case. Don't know who actually did the killing. Um, and this video is used against him as evidence of his gang association and then as evidence of motive for the murder, the prosecution saying that this was a rival gang attack. So throwing a gang sign in a music video at 14 years old becomes evidence of motive for a murder two years later at the age of 16. And that was despite there being little evidence to suggest that this crime actually involved any particular gang. So the only evidence of that came from, or direct evidence of that, came from a hearsay statement from one witness, which the Court of Appeal acknowledged was an unreliable hearsay statement and yet still upheld the decision to admit um, the video as part of this collection of gang evidence. The concept of a gang itself is heavily racialized, and I think that makes it all the easier for the prosecution to use rap in this way, but also all the more worrisome. Um, the term gang lacks a precise definition. The closest that we have to a legal definition is section 34.5 of the Policing and Crime Act of 2009, which provides the power to grant a gang injunction. And gang injunctions are um, supposed to be preventative, um, preventing gang violence. So for the purpose of this legislation, Something is gang related if it, if it occurs in the course of or is otherwise related to activities of a group that one, consists of at least three people, and two, has one or more characteristics that enable its members to be identified by others as a group. Um, by that definition, most of us could be in gangs. Um, children in school uniform, if there's, if there's at least three of them and they're in school uniform, they're identifiable. Um, People on sports teams, if they're wearing particular colors or have a uniform, three or more judges or barristers in their wigs and gowns are um, have one or more characteristics which make them identifiable as a group. So it's an incredibly broad and unhelpful definition of what a gang is. The CPS guidance on gang crimes offers various types of gangs, including uh, definitions of various types of gangs, including organized crime gangs and the very racially loaded um, urban street gang. And their definitions focus more on criminal behavior, but they're still very vague. What ends up happening in practice is that the gang label is disproportionately applied to black people. And we see this in, in um, gang databases, including the Metropolitan Police's very controversial gang matrix. Um, approximately 80% of people on the matrix are black. Being on the matrix doesn't mean that one is in a gang. This is another one of the, the Met Police's risk assessment tools and people find their names on this list for all sorts of reasons. It can be because of where they live, who they're seen to associate with. And these associations could be because they are school friends, or maybe they play football together on the weekends or, or whatever it is. Um, it can be because they are feature in drill videos. Amnesty International did a report on the gang matrix a few years ago, which noted that the indicators used to identify gang members simply reflect elements of youth culture and identity that have no link to serious crime. But by disproportionately applying this term to black people, the term itself comes to evoke stereotypical images around black male criminality. So if we have a young um, black man or boy on trial and the prosecution say this is a gang crime, the defendant fits the image in the court's mind or in the jury's mind of what a gang member looks like. Um, and the prosecution's case or theory becomes plausible. And all the more so where there are multiple defendants in the dock, which there often are in these cases. So there's a ready-made gang right there uh, in the courtroom. So rap music can be used in a way which amplifies these images in order to link black men and, and boys to crime. All the more so when rap videos themselves draw on the gang aesthetic as a way of appealing to an audience. Um, this gets done in cases like Sode, as I said, where evidence of it in the crime actually involving any particular gang is, is quite weak, even weaker in the case of Awoyemi, which is a, quite a complex case. Um, 
but here rap was helped to you used to help build a gang narrative in relation to an attempted murder and also to show a familiarity with firearms and violence this was despite there being little evidence that this was a gang crime it wasn't clear who the victim of the attempted murder was the perpetrators of the offense had shot a gun through a closed front door being reckless as to who was on the other side and apparently they went to the wrong house so we don't the prosecution had a suggestion as to who the intended target was but there wasn't any evidence to substantiate it so we don't know who they were trying to kill there was also no intelligence or evidence of a hostility between the two gangs which the prosecution said were involved so if we don't know who the, the intended victim is and there's no evidence that these two gangs dislike or are violent towards each other how does rap music which even rap music which is expressly declaring support for one of these gangs help to prove any issue in the case um, and yet the court of appeal upheld the decision to admit the um the videos and lyrics finding that the case bore all the hallmarks of a gang crime which is terminology i've seen also in the case of Sode and in other cases. Um, in this case, the, the, the hallmarks included the fact that two cars have been driving in a so-called convoy from one area of London to another. So even the language which gets used by the Court of Appeal in some of these cases is quite inflammatory. Um, in the context of gangs, I also just wanted to briefly raise the issue of police officers acting as um, experts for the prosecution. So in the cases that I've looked at where there's mention of an expert witness, it is a police officer. And that's also consistent with what I'm hearing um, anecdotally. Officers are usually presented as experts on gangs. And I think in some cases that can be quite troubling, but I do accept that police officers can have special knowledge from their experience and, and local, uh, knowledge of, of local communities. Um, and according to the Privy Council in the case of Myers and um, the Queen, police officers can act as gang experts, but there needs to be a qualitative assessment of their expertise, the sources of their knowledge. What I'm finding troubling um, is that in their capacity as so-called gang experts, they're being invited to interpret and contextualize rap music, and they will usually invite the court to interpret lyrics very literally. Um, there are two main problems with this. One is that being an expert on gangs does not make one an expert on rap, so a, a problem related to you know, are they qualified to give this evidence? Eric Nielsen and Andrea Dennis are two scholars from the US who've worked quite extensively on what they call rap on trial. Um, they explain that rap is defined by its complex wordplay, evidence in its dense slang, coded references, intentional mispronunciations, and sometimes blazing fast delivery, all of which defy interpretation at every turn. And there's also a lot of dark humor within rap, which can make it even more difficult to distinguish between what is real and, and what is not. So rap is highly vulnerable to misinterpretation. Unless a police officer has researched the history and the conventions of rap music, has stayed up to date with local slang that's always changing in, in any particular area, um, or themselves are immersed and involved in rap culture, they're simply not going to be experts on um, rap music. It would be more appropriate for the courts to hear from social scientists, from musicians, from experts in rap and hip hop and in popular culture. Um, Nielsen and Dennis explain the implications of using untrained police officers who are adamant that rap can be interpreted literally, which just goes to show how little um, they know about rap, um, which is that their testimony will be wildly unreliable. The second issue is one of partiality. And here I'm going to defer to a quote from criminologist uh, Jonathan Alan who wrote an article last year in the British Journal of Criminology on criminalizing drill. Um, he says that whilst it might be assumed that the police would draw on intelligence and local knowledge in their interpretations, intense crime fighting motivations and institutional racism might discourage more circumspect readings. Interpreting drill is nothing more than incitement to violence or online gang conflict. Street illiteracy, as he calls it, substitutes stereotypes for deeper understanding. It dismisses the ability of the particularly Black urban disadvantage to produce and participate in abstract artistic expressions and cultural complexity. So we have potentially unqualified and biased police officers giving um, unreliable evidence in a way which undermines the artistic nature and value of, of rap music. And there's also an inequality of arms in most of these cases, because while the prosecution will present a police officer as an expert, the defense often don't counter that um, with their own expert witness. Okay, turning around away from the gang issue and on to the legal basis for admission of rap as evidence, it's usually admitted as bad character evidence. Um, bad, to be admitted, bad character evidence need not only be relevant to an issue in the case, but it also has to satisfy a gateway for admission in the Criminal Justice Act of 2003. And in most of these cases, Gateway D was applied. Uh, under Gateway D, evidence is admissible if it is relevant to an important matter and issue between the defendant and the prosecution. 
And in most of these cases, um, that matter would go to state of mind, say intention or to motive more generally, or rebutting a defense such as innocent association or presence. In some cases, the evidence got around the bad character gateways because it was said to be to do with the alleged facts of the offense under Section 98 of the 2003 Act. Um, here, though, it's worth noting that the lyrics are, aren't to do with the alleged facts of the offense because they're about the offense. Very rarely could it be argued that the lyrics are actually referencing the crime which the defendant has been charged with. Rather, it's said to be to do with the alleged facts of the offense because it helps to shed light on the defendant's state of mind or disposition at the time of offending. So in a case like Sode, um, rapping about allegiance to a gang two years earlier, helps to establish a motive for the crime and motive is to do with the facts of, of the offense. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on the application of the bad character provisions. My main concern around these relate to um, the way in which relevance is assessed by the courts and I'll talk more about that shortly. But I do like to raise the question of why rap is being treated as bad character evidence. So the legal definition of bad character evidence in the 2003 Act is evidence of misconduct or disposition towards misconduct. And that's defined as um, commission of an offense or reprehensible behavior. Violent rap lyrics are usually treated as being reprehensible. Uh, it's not clear why though. If rap is an art form, it's a highly skilled art form. We wouldn't ordinarily consider it reprehensible to write or perform violent lyrics in other genres of music, um, to perform violent plays. It's recently been brought to my attention that opera is one of the most violent forms of art in terms of its content. We don't consider it reprehensible to write violent novels, to play violent video games. So what sets rap apart from these other um, fictionalized forms of art and violent pastimes? And I'd be interested in hearing other people's views on this. I, I think what most obviously sets it apart is that it is a form of black expressive culture um, performed primarily by young people who fit a pre-existing image or stereotype of, of what a criminal looks like um, and a, an assumption that black arts cannot reach the same levels of sophistication as, as white arts um, and therefore can be taken at face value, which as I said earlier, there's a, there's a longer and broader history of sort of criminalizing and devaluing black arts and cultures. Um, having said that, from a law of evidence perspective, there might be some benefit in having the evidence classed as bad character evidence, just insofar as not only does it need to be relevant to be admissible, but it has to clear one of the gateways in the 2003 Act. So there's something of an additional hurdle and directions that are given to juries on bad character evidence might be more um, specific or tailored than they otherwise would be. Having said that though, looking at the case law, it doesn't look like the 2003 Act is acting as any kind of barrier to the admission of this evidence. Okay, um, in terms of the outcome of these cases, so I've found only one case in which an appealant successfully um, appealed the use of rap as evidence against them. I mentioned earlier that not all cases involve a direct challenge to the use of evidence. It was, it was a minority of cases that did, but where there was a challenge, there was only this one successful case. And this was the case of Alimi. And here the court of appeal quashed a conviction. I think it was for murder because the appealant's presence in two music videos as an extra, I think he, he was swaying in the background of one and drinking in another, he wasn't really doing anything. This did not show gang association in the way which the prosecution had been permitted to present in court. Um, overall though, the low success rate in these cases is concerning, especially because the questions around the relevance of the evidence and its prejudicial effect aren't scrutinized as carefully as I had expected them to be when I started looking at the case law. Um, so in terms of relevance, I'm sure many of you will know to be admissible evidence must be relevant, meaning that it must help to prove or disprove some issue in the case. Usually the Court of Appeal agreed that the evidence was relevant for whatever purpose it had been adduced by the prosecution, usually going to state of mind or motive or rebutting a defense. Um, the cases tend to lack information about the actual content or context of lyrics or videos, but as I mentioned earlier, they're very rarely, I think there's maybe one case which someone might be able to convince me that the lyrics were about the offense, um, which the individual had been charged with. They don't need to be directly related to the crime to be deemed relevant. The cases also tend to lack basic information about whether lyrics were written or performed by the defendant and when the material was created. And when this is raised, it's not, again, it's not scrutinized as carefully as I would have expected it to be. So in the case of Sode, for example, the defense um, or the appellant did raise the fact that this video was two years old. The response of the Court of Appeal was simply that that did not reduce its impact or diminish its relevance. 
with no explanation as to why. Um, in an earlier case of O, the appealant was tried for possession of firearm with an ammunition with intent to endanger life. Um, the fact that he'd rapped about guns and gangs in a video six months previously um, did not make it too remote to be relevant. And it was then used as propensity uh, to show his propensity as a gang member to use gun violence for the purposes of endangering life, despite the fact that there was no specific threat towards anyone um, in, in these lyrics. These kind of dismissive statements about the passage of time, as I said, I found a bit surprising because if we're treating this as bad character evidence, one of the factors which affects the relevance and admissibility of bad character evidence is the length of time between the previous misconduct and, and the offense at issue. Um, one thing which the courts have made clear does affect relevance is the extent of the defendant's participation. So we know from the case of Alimi that simply being present in a music video won't be sufficient to make that the contents of that video relevant evidence. Beyond mere presence though, it's not at all clear where the threshold of participation lies. Um, there's another case called Lewis, which I haven't referenced on the slides, uh, multiple appealants in this case, and one of them had been standing in close proximity to a co-defendant in a music video who was rapping about violent things. He had got a shout out and he had used gun fingers in the video, which is a really normal thing to do in a rap video. And that was sufficient to make the content of that video um, character evidence in, in respect of him. The conventions of the genre, it's largely fictional nature, are rarely um, really engaged with. Where this is raised, the court has taken the view that it goes to the weight of the evidence rather than to its relevance and admissibility. And this is something that I would love to hear other people's perspectives on, because it seems to me that um, the conventions of the genre are what make it more often than not inherently unreliable as statements of fact, which means that it will have little to no probative value, which means that it's not relevant. The closest I've found to the court acknowledging this is a case called Solomon, um, where the court quite strongly expressed the view that the lyrics of songs that people choose to record on their phones will often or perhaps typically have no connection to the factual reality of their own lives. The lyrics at issue here was, it was the title line of a song, uh, sold guns to straight killers, straight being spelled S-T-R-8, in the context of uh, an offensive possession of firearm with um, intent to endanger life. So the court recognized that lyrics are fictional in nature, but then found that it would be reasonably apparent to the jury that lyrics of a song do not necessarily or perhaps commonly bear a connection with actual real life events, and so no problem with the lyrics having been admitted. For reasons I'll come on to very shortly, I don't think that that's necessarily reasonably apparent to juries, um, but still I'm finding it difficult to reconcile the court's view that um, lyrics will usually bear no connection to real life with the decision that the lyrics were relevant to the appealant's activities and, and state of mind in that case. In the case of O, oh, the trial judge's statement seems to be more indicative of, of the approach or attitude here, um, where it was stated that the fact that the assertions made in the video, which I have seen, revolting though they are, are not extraordinary by the standards of modern music, it seems to be entirely beyond the point. So as I said, the conventions of, of the genre are not um, preventing its, its admission in, in these cases. Turning just briefly to fairness and prejudicial effect, so even if evidence is relevant, it should not be admitted if its probative value is outweighed by its prejudicial effect. Um, the potential for prejudicial effect when it comes to rap music is huge. Jurors might attach far more weight to the evidence than it warrants, if it warrants any at all. This can be because of lack of understanding of conventions around the genre. It could also be um, because it plays into pre-existing notions and biases around Black people and rappers. There have been several empirical studies taken, um, conducted in the US which have found bias against rap music rooted in racial stereotypes. So one of the earlier studies, a 1999 study by Freed, two groups of participants were given identical violent lyrics. One group were told that they were rap lyrics, the other group were told that they were from a country song, and the group that thought they were rap uh, lyrics rated them as being more objectionable and in need of regulation than the group who thought that they were country lyrics, and they in fact came from a folk song. That study was replicated in 2016 with the same results. And the same results were also achieved where instead of giving the genre of the music, the participants are given a photograph of the singer with um, that being rated more harshly when they think the singer is black than when they thought the singer uh, was white. Um, even more recently in 2018, a study by Dunbar and Kubrin 
participants were more likely to assume that a rapper is in a gang, has a criminal record, or is involved in criminal activity than artists from other music genres based merely on the genre of the lyrics rather than the actual content of the lyrics. So these kind of studies show the potential at least for prosecutors to use rap uh, to reinforce biases and preconceived notions around black criminality. Yet the appeal judgments don't engage with any of this. I don't, there was no mention of, of the racialized aspect of this evidence or its disproportionate use against black people in any of the judgments, which didn't at all surprise me, but I think it's something worth noting. Um, the courts do acknowledge the potential for prejudicial effect, but then take the view that it would not be unduly prejudicial that jurors can be trusted to put their emotions aside and attach proper weight to the evidence um, with a, a direction from the judge and sometimes even where that direction was lacking in parts. Um, in fact, overall, the Court of Appeal, Appeal seems to be quite complementary of the way in which the um, lower courts have been handling gang evidence, including um, rap evidence. So in Awayemi, for example, they say in our experience, as a general rule, judges are acutely conscious of the dangers of admitting gang affiliation um, evidence and take great care to ensure that bad character evidence is admitted through the appropriate gateway. When it comes to rap, at least, I'm not sure whether I could disagree with that anymore based on what I see in the reported um, case law. When it comes to directing the jury, I think it's worth noting that the direction that's given is aimed at explaining why the evidence was admitted and how to use it. So if we're dealing with a gang case, for example, that this evidence um, may but doesn't necessarily help to show gang affiliation. And if it does, then that may but doesn't necessarily help to prove some issue in the case like motive. The broader context, the social influences, the conventions of rap, genre, of rap music don't usually need to be any part of a direction to the jury. Um, without that context, though, and in light of that empirical research that's coming from the states, it's very difficult to see how the evidence would not be unduly prejudicial unless the jury just happens to be made up of, of 12 young rap fans, which is highly unlikely. Okay, um, to wrap up then, so I've been saying I'm, I'm still at the early stages of this project. I'm not sure if that's uh, true anymore, but I'm certainly still have a lot of work to do, a lot of groundwork and, and further reading to do around this. But so far, I, I have three main concerns with what's happening. The first is the deliberate targeting of rap music, and it's used predominantly against um, Black young men and boys, which appears to be a way of amplifying uh, stereotypes about Black male criminality. Secondly, is the way in which the courts are determining admissibility with little consideration of factors which will affect probative value of the evidence um, and also glossing over the prejudicial effect of the evidence. And thirdly is the treatment of rap as bad character evidence, labeling it as reprehensible, conflating art with character, which I think uh, shows a real lack of understanding of the genre and an unwillingness to, to treat it as a form of art. In terms of what we do about this, it may be that a blanket exclusionary rule is required. Um, I'm not suggesting that rap music will never be relevant to an issue in the case, but rarely will it be relevant to an issue in the case. And we see this kind of blanket exclusionary rules well, subject to exceptions when it comes to other kinds of unreliable evidence like hearsay or other kinds of controversial evidence like sexual history evidence. So maybe there, this is something that could be done with rap, but as a minimum, Admissibility decisions need to be far more rigorous and better informed. Uh, they need to be made with a solid understanding of the conventions and the social influences of rap for which we need properly um, qualified expertise to assist the courts. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>